thankful people. Father, help us to reflect and meditate on your goodness and your kindness to us. And Lord, we ask that our worship today and this hour would be pleasing in your sight. And Father, we thank you for the prayer that Jesus has given to us that we can pray together. And Lord, we ask that you would hear us as we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue in our worship by singing together, Jesus shall reign.
Sing together. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I Sure, the price it has been paid for Jesus fled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I all my hope is only seated. Jesus now.
and you may be seated. As we go to the Lord to confess our sins this morning, I'd like to read from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. We read, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Let us pray together. Our great God and Father, we thank you for this day that you have given to us to be able to confess our sins to you and to one another and to be reminded that not only are we sinners, but that as sinners, we need to confess our sins and we need to be reminded that we need again the fresh cleansing of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, our God, for your son, Jesus Christ, and what he did for us on the cross, all the suffering that he went through, being made our sin, how he cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he truly was forsaken. He truly was alone. God, we thank you that he was forsaken, that he was alone, so we never, ever will be forsaken. And even though there are times in our lives when we feel we are very much alone and nobody cares, not even you, that that that's a huge mistake and poor thinking on our part, that you will always care for us because there was that time when no one cared for Jesus. God, we thank you that through his stripes that we are healed. We thank you that all through his sufferings that we are made new. And our God, we thank you that as we come together to worship you this day, that we come really as a forgiven people. And our Father, we pray that we would worship you and praise you and thank you for the forgiveness of sin that we have. And we would be so amazed at your grace in our lives that we would just be in awe of how much you love us. And to even think that you chose us in your Son in eternity before the world ever began and you chose us in love. So Lord, may our worship really reflect such an amazement that we should have of how extensive and really eternal your grace is. And Father, we pray that you would help us to know deep in our souls that we are justified, that we are cleansed, that we are accepted, that we are forgiven, that Jesus never will forsake us. And Lord, may that be the power that uh, encourages us to go forth with confidence and with poise to serve you each and every day of our lives. And Father, help us to be bold as people, to share the gospel with others, to speak of you, to not be ashamed of Jesus. And so Lord, assure our hearts this day. Help us to be reminded that we're yours and we're forgiven. And help us, Lord, to extend that forgiveness and grace to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We have the privilege of welcoming new members today, and uh, they're going to publicly acknowledge their faith in Christ by answering a few membership questions. Um, and I'd like to invite them up. Bob and Claire Rothrock, come on up and stand up right here. And Zach Morrow is also here. You can come up and stand over here. Um, you can demask if you like, that's fine. We can see your, your actual face. Um, I wanna remind us uh, about the church and what it means to be a member of the church. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul describes the church as the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, you Christians are the body of Christ and individually members of it, he says. Paul also says in Ephesians 4 that there is one body and one spirit one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. In other words, we are united by Christ by virtue of his uh, personhood who allows us to be part of one body because we all belong to Jesus. Therefore, we all belong to one another as a community of faith that is the church. In Ephesians 1.22, Paul tells us that Jesus is the head of the church. So church membership is not simply submission to a bunch of elders, although it is that, but is submission to Christ as head of the church through the local body. And finally, Hebrews 13, seven reminds people who have uh, committed themselves to a church, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls 
as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So let me introduce Claire and Bob Rothrock. You all both work for Trans World Radio right here in Cary, which broadcasts gospel messages all over the world. Um, now, Claire, you were born in the United Kingdom, so you have a wonderful accent like the rest of us don't. So that's, that's, you should talk to her just to hear her speak, although she has good things to say as well. Um, you grew up Baptist, um, and you all moved to the Netherlands. Um, you and I have a lot of connections, by the way. My parents lived in the Netherlands for a while as well. Um, you recommitted your life to Christ uh, through an Anglican church in the Netherlands. And uh, then you, you guys met in 1994, got married in 96, uh, when you were working for TWR. Um, then you moved here to the United States in 2017. Um, and you, you visited Peace uh, initially with Bill and Joan Milo, is that right? Yeah, and their support, they were supportive missionaries of ours. And he's actually going to be here next week, which is really, really wonderful. So, um, and uh, you enjoy sewing and knitting. So if you need, need anything sewed or knitted, all right, Claire can do that for you. We have other seamstresses, but we have added another, so that's good. Uh, now, Bob grew up in a Baptist home, a Christian home, Baptist and Presbyterian, accepted Christ in 1969. One of your favorite scriptures, you told me, is Psalm 139, because it reminds us that God pursues us even when we stray. And some of your hobbies are uh, writing projects about military family members. Is that right? Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, great. And then Zach over here. Um, Zach is married to Lauren, who's our assistant youth director. Okay, you guys know Lauren. She's up here all the time. Um, Zach grew up in a Christian home, but, but rejected the faith for part of your high school years um, due to a grandparent who suffered with pancreatic cancer. Um, but the Lord worked through different people in your life to bring you back to himself. And you told us that your favorite verse is Romans 5, 6 through 8, and one of, those, one of the snippets from that passage is, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, you also mentioned that one of your favorite worship songs is Christ is Mine Forever Forevermore, which we do here, which is one of my favorites as well. And this is, this is what I don't understand. You are a PhD student at NC State in applied mathematics. Now, that sounds boring. Now, it might not be, but it, sound, it's, it sounds uninteresting to me. But that's a joke, of course. I'm sure it's fascinating. But um, that, that, that's wonderful. And then you guys have a, a dog. Now, tell, tell me the truth. Do you guys do you spoil the dog? Okay, is that true? Okay, all right. I wanted to make sure we have it documented for the internet that you have spoiled this dog. Okay, okay. Well, um, just wanted to introduce you guys to them, and after the service, please say hello at a socially distance, uh, distance. Uh, but I'm gonna read a few things from the Book of Church Order and then ask our membership questions. And if you agree with those questions, just answer, I do. Uh, the Book of Church Order, uh, which is our manual of operations, is kind of our procedures for our Presbyterianism um, based on biblical principles. The Book of Church Order, uh, chapter 57, verse 5, or, or section 5, rather, uh, of the number of those who were baptized in infancy as members of the Church of God by birthright and as heirs of the covenant promises, the session has examined and approved Bob and Claire and Zach, who come now to assume for themselves the full privileges and responsibilities of their inheritance in the household of faith. So just remember, answer I do if you agree. Question one, do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure, and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy, do you? Do. do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners, and do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel, do you? Do. Question three, do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ, do you? Okay. Question four, do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability, do you? Okay. And question five, do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace, do you? Just by way of reminder for all of us, these membership vows are ones that you all have taken as well, and so it's important for us to remember them and uphold them. Uh, Acts 2.42 tells us that the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and we are no different. Those are the things we ought to be devoted to as members of this church and of any church, really. And Hebrews chapter 10 tells us, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So let me pray for us, and uh, we're going to welcome Bob and Claire and, and Zach into our Peace Church family. Let's pray. 
Lord, we are thankful to welcome new members in, although they've been members for a little while because of our COVID restrictions. We haven't had new members uh, for a while. But Lord, we are thankful that they have uh, made a home here, and we do pray that you would bless each of those families in their endeavors to pursue you and to pursue professional goals as well. We, would you, we ask that you would bless them in all those things, and we, we pray that they would have a fruitful time of ministry here at Peace Church. We pray, pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. You can be seated. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you this morning. My name is Lauren Morrow, the Assistant Director of Youth and Children here at Peace. Um, and it's always wonderful to see new members uh, coming to our church. Um, and I want to highlight a few other things that are happening in our church, our church life announcements. Um, the first one is that we are continuing to do our Thanksgiving boxes this year. Um, it says here in our bulletin we've done it for over 10 years, so we're continuing on with this year. Um, we're partnering with two local ministries, Pardoned by Christ and converting hearts um, and comforting care needs your help um, they have asked each community group to prepare one box to be donated um, and if you can commit to do this please commit by um, replying to Lou Paulus at gmail.com saying that you would like to provide a box by November 5th so that's coming up here shortly um, and these boxes will be donated so please if you are able donate a Thanksgiving box to help out these great ministries another thing I would love to highlight is that we are still praying for you guys as a staff the elders um, and we would love to know what requests we can be praying um, there's a few different ways that you can tell us the requests that you have um, via prayer card we have a text service. We have a form on our website, peacepca.org slash prayer. Uh, you can email us or you can call or text prayer line. And the reason we have so many ways that you can do it is because we do love having your prayer requests. Um, we're a church, a big body of Christ, that we would love to know what requests we can be praying. So please um, send us your requests. Uh, it is such a privilege as a staff member to be able to pray for them every Tuesday. So please uh, send us those prayer requests and you can find the ways how to uh, on, in your bulletin or at peacebca.org slash prayer. Um, another announcement that I would like to highlight is we have a election night of prayer coming up and this is going to be on November 2nd. Um, that is this Monday, so tomorrow from 6.30 to 7.30. And this is a way that we can partner with a church, um, Grace Presbyterian Church in Kernersville. And we are able to pray with them either virtually or in person. And there's going to be a guided time of prayer, an hour long time of prayer. So please um, get involved in that if you would like. There's more information on that, um, ways that you can get involved virtually and in person. Uh, the next thing I would love to highlight is we are having a virtual Christmas um, singing this year. Uh, it will be virtual and you can join the worship team, adult choir, orchestra, and peacemakers for singing the fourth verse of O Come All Ye Faithful. Um, we ask that if you would like to be involved, please send a video of yourself, um, film yourself and your family singing this song um, by November 8th. And if you have more questions about that, you can contact Megan Clayton with questions. Um, it's a way that we can all sing together, uh, form a uh, video together, and if you're more interested on details about that, you can look at peacepca.org slash Christmas. Um, so yeah, please be involved with that. It's a great way to uh, jumpstart the holidays and be involved in that singing. Um, the next thing I would like to highlight, the final thing, is uh, we still have youth group going on. Actually, tonight we are having our not Halloween costume party, because uh, it's a day after Halloween. So if you are able to come, if you're a 6th through 12th grader, we would love for you to come dress up. We'll have... Um, games, we're going to have a lesson, and it'll just be a fun time to um, celebrate not Halloween, but Halloween kind of. Uh, so that's tonight at 6 to 7.30. Uh, if the rain rains us out, you will get an email this afternoon. So please come out to that. Please be involved. And at this time, I'll call up Don Reno to pray for us. Thank you. Actually, Alec is going to do the prayer, but I am uh, here to make another announcement. You know, I, uh, one of the things I do is I, I'm always interested 
in collecting quotes on prayer. Um, and uh, here's one from Spurgeon. Spurgeon, of course, was a great man of prayer, uh, and he had a church that was a praying church. He says this, we shall never see much change for the better in our churches in general until the prayer meeting occupies a higher place in the esteem of Christians. You know, he had a, you may have heard this story where he told somebody, let me uh, show you my boiler room. And he, he brought them down to the basement, but he didn't show them the, the mechanics of getting the heat to the church. He showed them a prayer meeting that was down in the basement that prayed while he preached. So here's another one about a boiler room. Leonard Ravenhill. Leonard Ravenhill was a, a man that uh, wrote lots of books on prayer. I have a lot of them. Let the fires go out in the boiler room of the church and the place will still look smart and clean, but it will be cold. The prayer room is the boiler room for his spiritual life. Now here's another one. The thermometer of the church is its prayer meeting, Vance Havner. And then one more quote. Now, who do you think I should quote last? God. Let's quote God. <laughs> if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and heal their land. The reason I uh, mention these things, these quotes, is that we're going to have another prayer vigil. We've long had a history uh, at peace of having a 24-hour vigil of prayer, and we're going to do that November 20th, Friday, starting at 5 p.m., and then going all the way to 5 p.m. on Saturday, the 21st. So how does this work under COVID? Well, it works similarly. Uh, we, we don't have quite as many in the congregation at once, so you want to sign up early. We're trying to get three or four per slot, but there's, uh, there's 24 slots. So that's a lot of people. Uh, last time, we just about filled them up, as I recall, even through the night. So you can go online on our website. There is a tab at the top, prayer vigil. It will show you how to sign up. Uh, you also can submit a prayer request online. And starting next week, we will have the physical sign up for that. Uh, and prayer cards. So the way this thing really works is, and what's so wonderful about it is people put prayer requests, they don't have to sign their name to it if they don't want to, but let me tell you, there's a lot of needs of prayer, for prayer in our church. And when you read those cards, and you come here to pray and read those cards, you'll be very moved to pray, believe me. There's so many things we need to pray for. So. Uh, keep that in mind. People are already, I went this morning and just checked to see if the thing was online. Of course, Andrea is always on top of it. It was already on the online and people are already signing up for it. So go there today even and get signed up. Thanks. Let's stand and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Alleluia, alleluia. You may be seated. I'm Alec Fuller, one of your elders here. Please join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are worthy of all praise. You are the creator and sustainer of life. And we gather today to praise your name and ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Would you hear our prayers 
and make us more like Jesus in word and deed. With today being the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Christians, would you strengthen those suffering and cause the church to grow dramatically? These brothers and sisters face persecution that we can't even imagine while they stand firm for Jesus. Much of the persecution comes from Islamist and hostile governments. Would you continue to grow your church through the blood of these martyrs and put it upon our hearts to diligently pray for them. As COVID drags on and lives being disrupted and the number of cases spiking worldwide, would you show favor to those that are developing vaccines and treatments and have mercy on the ones with COVID and the people caring for them? Would you provide for the millions with lost jobs or businesses and the others with lost relationships and even now, there are many poor experiencing food shortages. Would you use this pandemic to draw multiplied millions or even a billion people unto yourself so that they may know eternal life through Jesus? Father, we pray for Dave and Sylvia Riggs with Wycliffe Bible Translators as they work on translations for the various indigenous people in Mexico. Father, would you also protect them as their daughter living with them has COVID. Father, you are the Lord of the wind and the fire. Would you show mercy in our country to those recovering from the hurricanes in the east and battling fires in the west? With our election in just two days, would you cause the more godly to be elected and the less godly to be voted out? Would you give your leaders in the church wisdom and knowledge and understanding that they may lead your people well. As racial unrest continues, may your justice rule and your peace reign as we look to Jesus for the real solution. Father, we pray for Tim Inman with the PCA Church Plan and Done as they deal with starting a church in a COVID environment. Would you make the light of the gospel burn brightly in Harnett County and draw many unto yourself in that church? Here at peace, would you rebuke Satan for stirring up gossip, resulting in division and distrust? Would you give us the desire to believe the best in others and bring unity among us? We pray for healing, strength, and encouragement for those in our midst dealing with cancer or other physical ailments, and those with mental or emotional challenges or addictions. Would your grace and peace abound and by your Holy Spirit, would you move for their good and your glory? Father, we mourn with the families of two members that died this week, along with others that have lost spouses, family members, and friends in recent days and months. We pray for many marriages in our own midst that are struggling. Would you bring healing and forgiveness and tenderness and would you calm the anger and bitterness and replace it with your love? Father, we pray for the search committee as they look for the man that you will be calling as our next lead pastor. Would you give them your wisdom and guidance? And finally, Father, would you open our ears and open our hearts as Jeff comes to preach, Father, that we may know that he is speaking your word to us, that you would soften our hearts to hear that message. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Jeff Smith. I'm one of the elders serving you. It's a privilege to present God's word this morning. In a moment, I will ask you to turn in the Bible to Acts 6, 1 through 4. It's also printed in your bulletin. A few weeks ago, we finished a year-long plus series covering the book of Acts, and now we're in the second of a five-week sermon series called Living Lessons from Acts, in which we examine the major themes and implications of Luke's biblical record from the early church. Last week, Pastor Ken Langley reminded us of the apostles' message and the example that we are indeed in a spiritual war, and yet a war that the Lord Jesus himself will win um, by the means he's appointed. Today we'll examine our primary weapons in fighting that war, 
as well as our proper motives in fighting it. What ministries are most necessary to have a fruitful church? Have you ever thought about this? We're, we're a fairly large church with a lot going on. In other words, what are the priorities and activities that the church needs most if you strip everything down to sheer basics? Many large, large churches these days have a coffee shop, for example, as one way of attracting church members and those from the local community. And I'm not meaning to disparage that. There's a lot of wisdom in that. If you have the resources, I think it's, it can be a good idea. Many people like coffee. Uh, people gather in coffee shops even now. And it can be a way to engage people in fellowship and attract new members to the church. But you can imagine that that's a fairly uh, tall order. It can be, pun intended. Uh, it could occupy so much time of members of leaders that it could prove to be distracting to the, the central functions of the church. How about a ballroom dance ministry or an art gallery? There are actually churches in our own denomination that have these as ministries. How essential are these? Well, we should think of these efforts in Christian love, I think. Just because we don't have it doesn't mean it's a bad idea. Uh, and God can use these things, but how essential are these things? These aren't in the Bible. They're not essential for the church to be the church. I think we'd all agree, and those churches would too. They run some risk of getting distracted. They're good ideas. They're helpful. But if you focus on those things first, you might get distracted from the most central work of the church. All right, how about a school? That hits a little closer to home because we have a school here, Peace Preschool. And um, it's very essential to develop children. Uh, it provides us an opportunity to expose young children who don't even come from church families uh, to the gospel and to give them an understanding of Christian love. And thanks to the work of Jennifer McGeehee and those serving alongside her, they're, they're coming to know, at least hear about Christ. So I consider our preschool to be success, but it's not exactly at the core of what makes us a church. Today we're about to read of a church in Jerusalem that had a ministry to impoverished widows. It's hard to imagine a more noble ministry than a ministry to impoverished widows. And yet, such a ministry posed risks to the church's faithfulness, as we will see. It was a necessary ministry that the love of Christ required and requires, but even feeding poor widows is not the top mission of the church. And such a ministry could even have prevented the apostles from praying and proclaiming Christ according to God's calling. If we're not careful, the good can be the enemy of the best in so many areas of life. And that's no less true in the church. We can become distracted from what the Lord Jesus wants most when we focus primarily even on legitimate needs. As a church, we must maintain our primary focus on bringing the kingdom, the evident reign of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth if we're to be faithful as individuals, as individual church members, and together. Basically, we need to learn to keep first things first. So let's return to that passage describing the situation in the Jerusalem church in Acts 6. It's in your bulletin. Please follow along silently as I read it in the English Standard Version. Now, in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty but we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Please pray with me. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to learn from your word. Would you help us, as Alec prayed earlier, uh, illumine our minds, help us think your thoughts after you, and incline our wills. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, but I really, routinely have a to-do list for my Saturdays. Um, it's the one day that's pretty open for me. Um, typically for me, this includes chores around the house, doing yard work, 
And on a Saturday morning, I wake up, I feel full of life, and I get excited about all I might accomplish that day. I have my list. I'm hopeful I can get shopping done, some yard work accomplished, especially in the fall when the leaves are, are coming down, and maybe even have some time left to enjoy a hike or maybe take in a movie, um, perhaps with friends. But as I get started on a task, I often discover, hey, there's something else here that needs to be repaired or cleaned or maintained or improved around my house. So um, perhaps like you, I go to my local home improvement store, and before I know it, an hour or more has passed by, and I'm probably at least $100 poorer. Uh, now, I mean well by thinking about other ways I could pack more into my day, but I fool myself when I start thinking these related activities really won't require any extra time or money, will they? I put my to-do to list out of sight thinking surely I'll come back to it, but uh, I get involved in other pursuits and I end up not accomplishing what I set out to do. I end up disappointed at the end of my Saturday. And the church can be this way. God calls churches to serve their members and those in the community in a variety of ways, whether formally through programs or just informally as in individuals carrying out our ministries. But we see in this passage that while without question, God calls the church to acts of service and mercy in the church, other activities, prayer and the ministry of the word specifically, are indispensable to the mission of the church and must continue as the top priorities of the church. Otherwise, we can lose focus on what God wants most from the church, for the church. So let's look again at Acts 6, 1 through 4. Let's walk through it. In the first century, as we can see in this passage, it was the practice of the church to distribute food and perhaps other necessities to widows in need. It wasn't even questioned, at least as far as the passage goes. This was just expected. Many widows in the first century, in first century Palestine, faced poverty as they had relied on their husbands and their children to provide for the household. There were no widespread public assistance programs that we have today, so the church had to be much more active if the poor among them were going to eat. Chapter 6, verse 1 in the English Standard Version speaks of the Hellenists in the church. Who were these? These were Jews who had lived outside of Palestine originally, the region Palestine being where Jerusalem is, and they later came to the area. They spoke a different language from that of the locals. They spoke Greek, and they had other customs unique to the regions they came from. Verse 1 also speaks of the Hebrews, and these were the Jews who were the natives to Palestine and especially Jerusalem, and they spoke Aramaic, a language that resembles the Hebrew language. And the Hellenists were the outsiders. They were the new kids on the block, the transplants. And we're told back in Acts chapter 2, you don't have to turn there, in 2.5, that there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews from every nation under heaven. So in the church, the widows of this background, we learn, were neglected by the Jerusalem church, whereas the widows who had lived their whole lives in and around Jerusalem were receiving the church's daily care. Now, we're not told why these Greek widows were being, Greek-speaking widows were being neglected. Maybe it was only a matter of the apostles being overwhelmed in their duties, or perhaps the long-timers in the church simply felt more comfortable with widows in the church they had known for many years, or who seemed similar to themselves, and so they overlooked the newcomers. We simply don't know. But we can gather from the passage that the church took for granted that widows in need should receive daily provisions from the congregation, and that there is to be no favoritism uh, in how we serve one another. But we discover in verse 2 that favoritism and food distribution was not the only problem. The primary task of the 12 apostles was to preach the word of salvation in Christ. Because of their leadership role in the church, they were also assuming responsibility to care for the needy. They said to all the believers there in verse 2, it is not right that we should give up preaching of the word of God to serve tables. Now, there's nothing wrong or demeaning about serving tables. In fact, the apostles were about to make clear that serving the needy in the church is a required task of the church. It's not an option. But serving food was not what God had primarily called 
the apostles, the primary leaders of the church, to do. And as we see in verse 4, the primary task of the apostles was to devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. By extension, the most primary tasks of the church were the practices of prayer and the ministry of the word, both directly, such as by the apostles, and by enabling others to do these things faithfully, devotedly, in support. We learn later in this chapter that God solved the problems of the unfair food distribution while also enabling the apostles to do the work God called them to do. God used the congregation to nominate seven men full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and it seems, as far as we can tell, these were the first ever deacons. I had the privilege of preaching on Acts chapter 6 back in December of last year. I won't hold you to remembering it, <laughs> but I focused on the office of deacon in that sermon, and if you're interested in hearing it, you can hear the recording on the media section of our website. But what I want to examine today from this passage are those first things uh, that, we, that, that we must keep first in the life of the church. As the apostles at the Jerusalem church discerned, the good can be the enemy of the best. We can become distracted from what God wants most for his church, even by doing works of service that God's love requires. God is building in this world a spiritual kingdom for his son, by his spirit, but also through us, by us. And our priorities can go astray if we let the church's primary focus drift, drift even toward meeting the needs of widows who are hungry, the needs God's love requires. These are secondary, supportive of the primary mission. Faithfulness as a church means keeping first things first. Keeping first things first means connecting everything we do in the church to prayer and the word of God. As the apostles remind us, in this chapter, we're called to pursue the church's primary mission using the primary means God has given the church and relying on our primary motivator for accomplishing it. With Acts 6, 1 through 4 then as our starting point, what is the church's primary mission? In other words, what is the most important thing that the Lord Jesus would have us focus on to accomplish here on earth? And we must advance the kingdom of God. This is our primary mission, advancing the kingdom of God. So what is the kingdom of God? Well, we know assisting needy church members is a calling of the church, but apparently it's not the primary mission of the church, because if it were, the apostles would, who were the primary leaders, would have continued dividing their time and efforts to serve the widows, wouldn't they? As, as noble as that is. Instead, they felt compelled to be on the front lines of an even more essential goal for the church. As Pastor Mike Ross pointed out to us two weeks ago, the phrase, kingdom of God, bookends this book of Acts. It's at the very beginning and at the very end. You don't have to turn there, but in Acts 1, verse 3, we're told Jesus presented himself alive to the apostles after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And then at the very end of the book, Acts 28, we're told the apostle Paul lived there in Rome two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him proclaiming the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the central thrust of Acts, and we see the kingdom of God breaking in from the future when it will come in fullness at Christ's return, breaking in through the prayers, the words, the ministry of the apostles and the rest of the church. The kingdom of God, Scripture doesn't give us a precise definition of it, but consider it as any kingdom, except this one has God as its origin and Jesus Christ as its appointed king. The kingdom of God is the evident rule of God. And advancing the kingdom of God is what we actually pray for, isn't it, in the Lord's Prayer. We just did it earlier this morning. Jesus' model prayer from Matthew 6 begins by addressing God as our heavenly father and then offers six petitions. The, the first three of those petitions are requests that God would bring his full reign on earth, to the same extent that he is already clearly, evidently, without hindrance, reigning and ruling in heaven. While the final three requests are for our own needs, 
The Westminster Confession of Faith elaborates. Question 102 says, what do we pray for specifically in the second petition of the Lord's Prayer? And it answers, in the second petition, thy kingdom come. We pray that Satan's kingdom may be destroyed and that the kingdom of grace may be advanced. Ourselves and others brought into it and kept in it and that the kingdom of glory may be hastened, may be brought quickly to earth. When we pray for God's kingdom to come, we are praying for the church to be strengthened, but also enlarged. We're praying for evangelism. We're praying for the making of disciples. How else will the Father's name be hallowed? How else could his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, unless there is a healthy growing church, expanding to reach the ends of the earth. Have you ever wondered why the church in the modern West seems to be weak and in decline? We read Acts and we're both encouraged and put to shame by the boldness of the early church, at least I am. We wonder why we do not experience the growth of the church today that they did. But the Lord Jesus desires to use us Yes, every one of us, to cause his future kingdom to break into the present world, even now, more and more. Thy kingdom come is the primary mission that drove the apostles and the early church. They didn't let the situation of the Hellenistic widows get in the way of that mission. Rather, they mobilized the whole church body to support that mission by calling on the congregation to nominate the first deacons. They connected everything in the church to the church's primary mission, thy kingdom come. And so must we, both outwardly and on our thinking, Monday through Saturday as well as today. And this brings me to my second point. What are the church's primary means? How do we accomplish our primary mission of advancing the kingdom of God? We have to give ourselves to kingdom prayer and the ministry of the word. These are our primary means for advancing the kingdom. Not just in a church in Jerusalem in the first century, but in all churches. The apostles and the elders following in their ministry after them had prayer in the ministry of the word as their primary duties in serving the church. And this doesn't mean that the church's leaders were the only ones called to pray or communicate the teaching about Jesus Christ. Rather, they made these the highest priority activities in the church, and they organized the church around these activities. I think what they were doing here in Acts 4 was freeing their own schedules to pray and to minister the word of God, but also they were connecting all of church life in this situation back to these priorities of prayer and ministry of the word. The apostles needed the deacons and those helping them to serve widows if the church was going to be faithful to this primary work. Certainly God didn't call the church to let the widows starve. No, he was rather changing his, he wasn't changing his priority of expanding his kingdom on earth through primary means, the activities he himself appointed. Free feeding, rather, the, the widows is essential to Christian love, but kingdom prayer and the ministry of the word are essential to being the church and expanding the gracious influence of Christ over the kingdom of darkness in this world. Focusing all of church life on just two primary activities is simple. It's simple, but it's not easy. As a church, we're tempted to fix our attention on even legitimate wants and needs and lose our focus on the kingdom of God. Some of you have attended meetings of the session, our elder board, or the diaconate, or of other committees, and so you know what I mean. That temptation is always there to get drawn away from those first things. And we're tempted to rely on our own smarts to expand the kingdom or to rely on special programs alone, or just to think that being nice to visitors will be enough for bringing the kingdom to earth. And these are all good things, but they're not first. The apostles make it clear here in the Jerusalem church of Acts 6, we can change the world for Christ. God wills that we change the world for Christ. And prayer and the word are God's specially appointed instruments for doing it. We can feed widows without prayer and without ministry of the word, and it would be an act of Christ-like love. But without prayer and the word, 
feeding them would not expand the kingdom of the one true God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Why is prayer one of the two primary ways God expands his kingdom on earth? We need to appeal to God because only God, his Holy Spirit, can convict of sin and change hearts to trust Christ. Consider the frequency and boldness we are to have in praying for the kingdom. Consider the frequency. The Lord's Prayer includes a prayer for our daily bread. So it's a daily prayer, isn't it? And so we should pray daily, not only for our bread, but for the kingdom to come, for his will to be carried out on earth just as it is in, as it is in heaven. And consider the boldness that the God of the universe, who can do everything, would have us petition him to bring about a worldwide change that culminates in the return of Christ bodily, the judgment day, the resurrection of all from the dead, and the new heavens and the new earth. God would ask, God would have us ask him for these things. We properly emphasize God's sovereign control over the world and his all-powerful grace in saving all who will ever come to believe. But God uses means. He has ordained our prayers to change history for all eternity. Our praying matters. It does not fall on deaf ears. Our praying is in accordance with what God commands. How could he not answer? when we pray this kingdom prayer. The early church knew this. In chapter four of Acts, after Peter and John returned from being detained by the Jewish leaders who told them to stop speaking of Jesus Christ, the church prayed, asking for power to speak of Christ even more boldly. You don't have to turn there. I'll read starting at verse 24. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. After being arrested, they did not come to God with a list of their needs. They did not ask God to stop the persecution. Rather, they asked him for boldness to be a faithful witness for Christ. There is nothing stopping us in our relatively comfortable situations from praying this way now and from God giving us the boldness as an answer to speak about Christ, not only from this pulpit, but from across a picnic table. Do you think that God does not love to answer this kind of prayer? God wants to extend the kingdom of Christ, but he wants us to come to him for it. Christian, do you desire it? Do I desire it? John Knox is known as the 16th century leader of the Protestant Reformation in Scotland and the founder of Scottish Presbyterianism. But by the end of his life, he probably became more well known for his praying than his theology or preaching. Of all the prayers of Knox, Lord, give me Scotland ere I die or before I die is the most known. And it was not an arrogant request, but rather it was a compassionate plea that came from his desire for the conversion of his fellow countrymen to Christ. His prayer boldly expressed a desire for God to expand his kingdom. When was the last time you prayed for our country like Knox did for his? Do we sincerely pray for the spiritual rebirth of our fellow Americans more than we do for a political cause, party, or candidate. Mary's, Mary, Queen of Scots, allegedly said at the time, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the assembled armies of Europe. 
She witnessed the answers of John Knox's prayers. Humanly speaking, Knox's prayers started and fueled Scotland's Reformation. God used John Knox and those who joined him in ministry to bring a revival among God's people. An, applica an application point for us. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, realize what you're praying. You're praying for the growth of the kingdom of God here on earth, leading up to the return of Christ. And elaborate on that prayer. Pray for those in your life God has placed there who don't know the Lord Jesus, neighbors, co-workers, others who need to be saved from their sins by looking to Christ. It's a prayer God's given. He will answer it. Together with prayer, why is the word one of the two primary ways God expands his kingdom on earth? We need to communicate the word of Christ because salvation is only through him. People need to learn about Christ to have saving faith in him. Probably some of you are familiar with the quote, preach the gospel at all times and use words if necessary. I understand that it's incorrectly attributed to Francis of Assisi. But if the apostles in Acts 6 had believed this quote, they would have been satisfied to redirect the primary focus of the church to feeding the poor at the expense of the ministry of the word. But they were not. No, people in the world need to hear actual words in order to be saved. They need to know what our good works are witnessing to. They need to know about the person and work of Jesus Christ. And this isn't revealed in nature. It's revealed only in words. God's word is not a dead letter. It is powerful and effective. Jesus said of his own teaching, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans that the gospel or good news about Jesus Christ is God's powerful instrument to save. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. But Paul asks in the book of Romans, how then will people call on him in whom they have not believed and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Communicating the word of Christ, whether by apostles in the past, pastors and elders today, or any of us, formally or informally, the ministry of the word is absolutely essential to accomplishing the church's mission, the mission of this church. So invite people to our worship service. Invite people to the live stream. Read and discuss the Bible at home and with others. Be ready to share the only news that gives lasting hope. Another application point. Get to be good at sharing a brief summary of who Jesus is and how he saves sinners. Not just your testimony, but who Jesus is and what he can do for anyone. Think about the various people in your life who don't know him and how you might explain the good news for them. What are they looking for in life that will only disappoint them but that Jesus Christ can satisfy? Last main point, what is the church's primary motivator? What will spur us on, brothers and sisters, to use kingdom, prayer, and the word of God to accomplish God's mission for the church? We tend to pray for and speak about our strongest needs and desires, don't we? I know I do. In times of past unemployment, concerns about a medical diagnosis or a need to make a major life decision, I've sought God with my most earnest, frequent, and even desperate prayers. And I must say, he has answered me graciously more times than I can remember. But our most intense prayers reveal our hearts. Students, some of you may struggle to earn the kinds of grades your parents or maybe you expect of yourselves. And when you're in danger of failing a class, you ask God earnestly for better study habits and better academic results, and rightly so. Some of you are facing terminal illness or a serious medical condition that just won't go away. You ask the Lord to comfort you and heal you and bless you, and you ask with great intensity, and it's exactly what he would have you do. We reveal our hearts through what we say enthusiastically. Also, several here have recently gotten engaged or married, welcomed a new child into the family, found a new job, achieved new personal goals. And when these things happen or when your favorite team wins or when you find a $20 bill in the parking lot, <laughs> you talk about it 
<laughs> you're glad, you rejoice, you celebrate. And this is right, acknowledging that God is the giver of every good gift. But why are we so slow? Why am I so slow to pray for the advance of the kingdom of Christ? Why so neglectful, fearful, or even ashamed to tell others about Jesus Christ? Have you ever prayed the Lord's Prayer for yourself? Not just the daily bread petition, but that God would advance his kingdom, not only in others, but in yourself. Because before I can pray for God to extend his kingdom into the world, and before I can share the good news of Christ with others, I need God to do a renewing work in me. And so do you. We should pray fervently for all kinds of needs and wants, and we should tell others of the good news of God's blessings of many kinds. But the advance of the kingdom of God can rise to be the subject of our fervent prayers and our enthusiastic words only to the extent that we taste its sweetness for ourselves. Jesus, to the church in Ephesus in the book of Revelation, said, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. They were generally faithful at being a church. Jesus even mentions their good works. The works probably included feeding the poor. But they had forgotten to keep first things first. They had abandoned the love for Christ they had when they first came to know him. Do you remember, Christian, the sweetness, the joy that you experienced when you first came to know Christ in a personal way? When you first came to know of the love he has for you? He died painfully and in shame to pay for your sins in full. Christian, your Savior loves you. He rose again from the dead to justify you before God. Jesus loves you. He ascended to the right hand of God the Father to continue to pray for you to this very hour. Jesus loves you. He will return to raise your dead body from the grave and bring you into his eternal perfected kingdom. In Christ, God loves you. When you cultivate remembering daily the costly boundless love God has for you in Christ, you want to pray for his kingdom to come. You want to pray for it more and more and to invite others into it. He is worthy, and he's building a kingdom of a multitude so great, only he can number it from every nation, tribe, and tongue. When you know the greatness and goodness of this king, when you experience it inwardly, you want to exalt him and you want to see others join you in that kingdom. Do you long to see the world change? We're about to conclude another four-year election cycle here in the United States, and we hear all kinds of candidates making all sorts of promises to essentially build a better kingdom here on earth. But will an election really change the world? Not fundamentally, no matter who wins or loses. But God wills to change the world, and he wills to change it through the likes of us. His church, yes, certainly through acts of kindness, such as feeding impoverished widows, but only as such acts of kindness complement and not distract from our prayers for God to build his kingdom on earth until Jesus comes and our proclamation of good news about him. You know, there are all kinds of ministries we can carry out as a church, as individuals, together. But only as we keep things, first things first, as we prioritize the advance of Christ's kingdom, of his loving rule over lives throughout the world through prayer and speaking the word to others, only in that way will he use us to change the world. But he will use us as we keep first things first. It all starts with the kingdom coming anew to every believer here. So let's pray now for it. Join me. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus Christ, our great King, Holy Spirit, giver of life, 
we ask you, we beg you to cause the kingdom to advance in every heart here, Lord. Make us your instruments to change the world according to your will. Exalt yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our communion hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Let's stand and sing together. You may be seated.
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be, be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. In other words, this is not an ordinary. Has everyone been served who wants to be served? If you have not, please raise your hand. Okay, I think we've got everyone. Let's open our bread. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Take and eat. Mark 14. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. So we will open the juice and drink together. Let's open this very carefully. Christ has died, 
Christ has risen. Christ will come again. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Romans 6, 1 through 3 tells us, We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. For sin will no longer have dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Let's pray together. Lord, we are once again thankful to come to this table to partake of this meal that reminds us with physical food that you have rescued us from our sins. You have declared us legally righteous, legally not guilty. Lord, that is hard for us to comprehend, but we are truly thankful that you will never die again and that that we have been rescued from such a terrible prison of sin. We are thankful when we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing the glory of Thank you for being with us today. Even with the rain, we're thankful for this crowd. And now receive the Lord's benediction as you go. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace.